Good to have all of you with us this morning. We're going to begin with a few announcements before we start our worship this morning. Gretna Baptist Church exists to help people discover, grow, and model faith in Jesus Christ. I trust that's why you're here today. If you are, you're going to hear Christ preached, and I trust that it will be an encouragement to you. First of all, I just want to say thank you for all those who were involved over... 70 of you were engaged and involved in the work of the Living Nativity over the past few days. Right out, a thousand people came through and heard the gospel. Amen? About 500 cars, different cars came through. 500 cars received one, or it's, if not two, copies of the Word of God. What a blessing it was to be able to preach Christ. Not only his incarnation, but his sacrificial death, and praise God, his resurrection, his whole story, which brings hope to mankind. Also, because we've had such a busy weekend, I'm going to give you the night off, all right? Go home, relax, spend it with your family. Maybe if you have another family member that goes to another church, maybe you want to go to church with them tonight. That's fine. Uh, tonight we're going to take a break, and then uh, we'll be back at it this Wednesday. Um, but before that, we have a deacons meeting for those who are deacons. Uh, also, the incoming deacons, uh, if you could make this meeting, that'd be great, um, just so we can get prepared, so we can hit the, hit the road running come January. So um, we'll see you this Tuesday at 6.30. Also, Wednesday night ministries are continuing. We have something for the entire family, nursery through adult Bible studies. So I encourage you to come get charged up midweek. so You can be light to a world of darkness. Also, children's program practice is this Saturday at 10 a.m. Also, they're going to practice as they leave to go out to children's worship today. Um, so, but this will be kind of the dress rehearsal, get ready kind of things this Saturday at 10 a.m. Uh, mark your calendars. And then, of course, the program is on the 19th at 10.30. So, let's go ahead and stand together as we begin our worship.
continue singing Angels We've Heard on High. Angels we have heard on high, sweetly singing o'er the plains, and the mountains in reply. our strength and power to exalt and give strength. Father, you are mighty and you are awesome. There is no one like you. Father, we know that with you, according to your will, all things are possible. You are with us. Father, you are mighty to save. Father, we ask through our, our Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, that in the hidden recesses of our lives, that we would be conformed to the image of Christ. Father, in the lives of our friends and loved ones who have yet to know you through Christ, we pray for their salvation. Send the Spirit upon them. Father, in the brokenness of the world around us and in the lives of those who are hurting, I pray that you would reveal yourself through us, your church, and fill us with your Spirit to love them as you have loved us through Jesus Christ. Father, forgive us for our apathy, for our distraction. Father, today we ask you that you would take your word and that we would be conformed by it. That we would hide it in our heart so that we would not sin against you. 
Father, strengthen us today. Reveal in us the need we have. And Lord, give us the strength to say yes to allowing you to fulfill that which is lacking. We ask these things in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Amen. You may be seated. Christmas songs I love to sing. We're going to sing now. I heard the bells on Christmas Day.
ladies come and bring us a special. you can head on out for children's worship. We're going all the way up through the fifth grade, all the way up through the fifth grade, so we can work on your Christmas program. Good to see a bunch of kids heading out there. It's going to be a good program. Appreciate that song. It begs the question, who reigns in your life? 
He's a loving God. He will not force Himself upon you. He gives you a choice. Life seems impossible, but God. That's been our theme for 2020. I think it's fitting, considering all that we went through in 2020, to have a theme like that in 2021. The foundation for this series has been Matthew 19.26. Jesus looked at them, and this is his conversation with this rich young ruler, and he says, with man, this is impossible, but with God, all things are possible. And in this case, this rich young man was dealing with the reality of, was he willing to give up his fame and riches in order to be a follower of Christ? Unfortunately for him, he did not make the right choice. We have now been working our way through the but God statements in the book of Galatians. We started in Galatians 1, verses 15 and 16. But when God, who set me apart from my mother's womb and called me, choice, amen, through Christ, we have been set apart for his glory. We are sanctified. Just a few reminders of the context of the book of Galatians. The author, of course, is clearly stated in chapter 1. Judas were affecting the church there in Galatia. And they were preaching a salvation other than justification by faith. Paul is clearly saying that justification by faith alone, apart from works, lest any man should ever boast. The fact that we are justified by grace through faith means that we have spiritual freedom, which we actually were talking about in Sunday school this morning, the spiritual freedom that comes through salvation. And that brings us to our text today. In Galatians chapter 3, verses 17 through 18, it says, What I mean is this, the law introduced 430 years later, that later after the covenant or the Abrahamic covenant, does not set aside the covenant previously established by God and thus do away with the promise, that is the promise of the covenant. For if the inheritance depends on the law, then it is no longer depends on the promise. In other words, the law cannot do away with the promise. If the law can somehow do away with the promise, then the promise was never good in the first place. But God, in His grace, gave the promise as we... Lord, I pray that we would learn to live by faith and not by sight. I pray that we would realize that in life when we find ourselves facing situations that seem unbearable or impossible, we have You. We can count upon You. Father, open the reality of our lives before You today. Allow us to see ourselves for who we are and what needs to change so that you can receive glory. Amen. Father, as we open up the word, we said, show us what needs to change. That's, what, that's how we prayed that prayer. Show us what needs to change. What are you depending upon? In other words, as the song was singing, who is reigning in your life? Last week, we talked about the blessing of the promise. We talked about some of the Old Testament promises and some of the New Testament promises. Promises are good things to have. 
as long as the person who made the promise is able to keep the promise, right? Praise God. God has never made a promise that he has not kept. Then we talked about the blessing of the promises last week. And we reinforced the idea that God's promise cannot be superseded. And by that we mean the law did not nullify the promise that was made to Abraham. And we're going to reinforce that today as we continue to teach. In fact, the law simply revealed the need for the promise. And when I say the promise, I mean the coming Messiah, Jesus Christ. Because the law, and we hope we reinforce this well, the law can never provide justification. In fact, the one who we think of as the father of faith, right? Abraham. No, you learned it as a child, right? Father Abraham, the Bible says it was appointed to him righteousness through what? Faith, not through works. So that brings us today to talk about the importance of faith. Why is your faith important? Well, let's go ahead. And let's examine the importance of faith today. I think it's important first to note that Paul has been hammering home in Galatians that salvation is by faith and not by works. And I think we need to understand that this is a distinguishing factor for Christianity as a whole, for the most part. This is why the... Re this is. This is one of the main reasons why the Reformation even started. Religion is man doing something somehow to earn favor with God apart from faith. Let me say that again. Not all religion. But religion apart from faith in Jesus Christ is simply man trying to do something to earn favor with God. And yet the Bible clearly teaches us that everything that we do, even the best that we have done, is nothing but filthy rags compared to His righteousness. See, Christianity is God doing something for man that man cannot do for himself. That's what it is. See, religion says do, but Christianity says done. There's a difference. Religion apart from faith in Christ says do, but Christianity, followers of Christ, realize that the work was done. That Christ's sacrifice was salvific and sufficient. And here in our text this morning, Paul is anticipating the Judaizers' next objection since they were huge fans of the law of Moses. In general, they recognize the importance of the Abrahamic covenant and in fact, what they were doing in this text is they were giving the Abrahamic covenant less of a priority than the Mosaic covenant. They were actually somehow saying that the Mosaic covenant superseded the Abrahamic covenant. Which, as I illustrated earlier and talked about earlier, would make God a liar. Because how can God make a promise to Abraham that he now denies in Moses? If it's according to our work. And this leads us to the conflict that we see in our text. 
So there's a question here that I think we have to ponder. The question is really, honestly, not a complicated question, but a, a pretty logical question, right? Why did God give us the law if the law does not save us? I think to understand that, we have to get back to understanding the promise in the first place. Let's look at verses 15 through 18 of chapter 3 of Galatians. Brethren, I speak in the manner of men, though it is only of man's covenant, yet it is confirmed no one annuls or adds to it. Now to Abraham and his seed, where the promise is made, he does not say unto the seeds, as of many, but as of one, and to your seed, who is, it, who is Christ. What is the purpose of the promise? To reveal Christ. And this I say, that the law, which was 430 years later, cannot annul the covenant that was confirmed before God in the Christ, that it should make the promise of no effect. You know, this shouldn't be shocking to us as we look at this text, because I think if we were all being honest, as human beings, we are always looking for a better deal, right? I'm thinking about, you know, this is a time and a season starting on Thanksgiving, right? Black Friday shopping starts. Everybody's looking online. They're going around to different places. They're looking for deals. They're looking for a better deal. And maybe you're holding out on buying something because you just know that come Christmas, they're going to mark this thing down and you're going to get a better deal. We always want the best deal. And as we look at Abraham and the covenant and the deal that God made with him, we see here clearly that this promise did not involve a work on Abraham's part. When you examine that relationship and that promise, he only had to believe and it was accounted to him righteousness according to God's word. That sounds like a pretty good deal. <laughs> Considering I know how hard it is to live a perfect life. I should say I know how hard it is because I've never been able to do it. And if you're honest with yourself, you've never been able to do it. But then 430 years later, according to our text, there seems to be what the Judaizers are looking at as the Great New Deal. <laughs> Boy, we've seen that in politics a time or two, right? The New Deal. Well, this time it comes to another Jewish man by the name of Moses. And we call this not the Abrahamic Covenant, but the Mosaic Covenant or the Mosaic Law. Abraham and all his descendants were saved by faith, but then God gave Moses the Law on the Mount of Sinai. And here we have our conflict. And here we find our controversy that the Ju Judaizers are propagating. Which do I follow? Which one is more important than the other? And I'm going to argue today that one is not more important than the other, but one simply reveals the need for the other. Do we follow the plan of Genesis 15 and Abraham's faith, or do we follow the rules of Exodus 20 and all the laws of Moses, which I can't even name them all here this morning? <laughs> which would make me really sad because I really like shellfish. And I love bacon. Yes. Ten pounds of it we had at men's prayer breakfast. Which one is more important? Does the law given later nullify the promise made earlier to Abraham? 
I think to answer this, Paul is seeking to highlight the person who's making the promise rather than our ability to keep the law. See, if I focus only on my ability to keep the law, who is the center of attention? Myself. Which quickly leads to legalism, which we were talking about this morning in Sunday's. But if I focus on the promise, it always leads me to the one who the promise reveals, which is Jesus Christ. Paul is highlighting the person who's making the promise. He wants to emphasize the reliability of the covenant God made with Abraham, and he wants to put the emphasis on the one who actually made the promise, the faithfulness not of me and my ability to keep the law, but the faithfulness of the one who gave me the promise. I think we all are familiar with the idea of a contract. When a contract or an agreement is made by people involving obligations and promises, when a contract is made, no one can add to that or take it away unless all parties are in agreement. That contract is going to remain as originally made, unless both parties have agreed, and then it is no longer that contract. It has now become a whole different new contract. For example, let's use Fred and Wilma Flintstone as an example. Wilma Flintstone dies. And Wilma Flintstone has put in her will that she wants to leave all her money to Fred. Now, no one can go back and argue what Wilma really wanted because she has put in a contract exactly what she wanted to happen. She has given her word because that is what her last will and testament said. No one can come along and change it later. It doesn't matter how important you are. It doesn't matter how smart you think you are, it doesn't matter even how much you think you deserve Wilma's favor, if she did not name you in the last will and testament, we think of these contracts as non-negotiable. And the, I think that's important for us to contemplate here because the idea is that if we expect this to be true in man-made contracts, you follow me here? If we expect this concrete obligation to take place in man-made contracts, how much more reliable and unchangeable is a God-given contract? If man is able to honor his word and establish an entire profession of law to, to support it, how much more important is God's word? In fact, look at verse 17 and 18. It makes this point very clear. It says, In this I say, that the law, which was 430 years later, cannot adult annul the covenant that was confirmed before by God in Christ. Listen, just because the law was given 430 years after the promise to Abraham that he was justified by faith does not nullify the promise that was made to Abraham. God is a God who cannot lie, who will not lie. It's impossible for him to break his promise. God made a promise that he would enter into a relationship with sinners through faith alone. And Abraham is the example that God has chosen to give. Just because some religious leaders or some religious organization comes along several hundred years later with the law, it does not nullify God's promise. Now, I want to make sure we all understand the Judaizers 
implied that the giving of the law changed the original promise. That is the argument. That is the point of contention here in the text. And Paul is arguing that it did not. But then he takes one step further and he says, this promise was not made to Abraham, but also to Abraham's what? Seed. You remember that little song? Father Abraham. We have been grafted into that promise, amen? We are the seed of Abraham. Christ is the manifestation of the seed of Abraham. It is the ultimate fulfillment of the promise, which is why Christ himself said, I did not come to destroy the law, but to do what? Fulfill the law. We are co-heirs with Christ. The promise was made to one seed and one descendant in particular, Jesus Christ. In the final analysis, God made this promise with Abraham through Christ so that the only two parties who can make any changes are God the Father and God the Son. It doesn't matter what religious leader. The only two parties that could change this contract or this promise was God the Father and God the Son, and they have committed themselves to the promise. God the Father and God the Son have agreed to graft us into that promise. Those who put their faith in Christ's redemptive work. Moses cannot alter this covenant. He cannot add anything to it. He cannot take anything from it. The Judaizers wanted to add to God's grace as if anything could be added to grace as if grace is not perfect as it is. And in doing so, take away from the very promise of God. They had no right to do this since they were not parties in the original covenant. This is not a biological promise to all Jewish people simply. This is a also, we need to understand We've been grafted into that promise. And I'm not saying that God is finished with Israel. I believe Israel has a purpose and a plan yet when you look at eschatology. But when it comes to the fulfillment of this promise, we have been grafted into the benefit of Christ. We, again, are co-heirs with Christ when we place our faith in Him. If you are spiritually related to Jesus Christ, you are a benefactor of the promise. God made a promise that people are justified by faith, and He doesn't come along 430 years later and say, oh yeah, I forgot about that tablet thing. Let's just switch this up and change it. He doesn't function that way. God doesn't work that way. Which brings us to our next obvious question. What is the purpose of the law then? Why does the law exist? Notice the opening of verse 19. What purpose then does the law serve? It was added because of the transgressions. You see... The purpose of the law is to reveal. To reveal our transgressions. See, the law was given to us because of sin. In fact, think about the law kind of like a CT scanner. Anybody ever had a CT scan? So a CT scan basically takes images or pictures. I don't know if you call them digital. Would the digital pictures be the right word? I don't know. I'm not smart enough on these things. A digital picture of your brain, your organs, your muscles. It reveals simply if there is a problem. 
but it doesn't fix the problem. It can't fix the problem. But it reveals the problem so you can go to another source and apply the medicine to hopefully fix the problem. See, the law is kind of like a CT scanner. It reveals the problem. But if you want to fix the problem, you have to go to the promise. Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ is the medicine that fixed the problem that the law reveals, is what we're saying. Just as a CT scanner takes a picture of what's going on inside your body, the law reveals the problem of sin within us. The purpose of the law is to reveal that which Christ removes as we call upon His name. The purpose of the law is to show us that which Christ overcomes. When I think about Christ overcoming, I think of that old song. There is a fountain Filled with blood drawn from Emmanuel's veins. And sinners plunged beneath that flood lose all their guilty stains. Lose all their guilty stains. Lose all their guilty stains. And sinners plunged beneath that flood. Lose all their guilty stains. There is a remedy. The remedy comes through the promise. You see, the law doesn't make us sinners. The law simply reveals that we are sinners. There is, in a sense, the law helps us to not only identify sin, but also prevent sin by seeing it. But the strength and the answer to overcome sin can only be found in Jesus Christ. I would even say the reason God gave us the law is because God knew that we have a tendency to sin. And He wants us to understand that. Isn't that the reason why we have laws in the first place? Not just the Mosaic law, but I'm talking about, you know, the speed limit. Boy, that's a, that's a touchy subject for me. If I see a sign that says, 55, I believe it's my right to drive 60. But the law says that's not the case. I'll drive 75 if I want to. If the speed limit, I mean, come on, I just bought a my stinger. I got to go faster. But the law doesn't care what kind of car I drive, the law doesn't care about my opinion. The law says the speed limit is 70. Laws are intended to restrain and reveal sin. But because of our sin nature, we do not want to be restrained, right? In fact, in some ways, laws provoke us to sin. <laughs> as evidenced by the song, I Can't Drive 55. I want you to think about what I just said and compare that to Romans chapter 5, verse 20. That says this, Moreover, the law entered that the offense might what? Abound. 
But where sin abounded, grace did much more abound. See the promise. Whatever you think the grace of God is, I assure you, it is infinitely better. The law does not make us better. In fact, I would argue that the law reveals what is wrong about us. The law makes us worse in some cases as our flesh is rebelling against it. The law, in some ways, magnifies and multiplies our sin, which means the grace of God gets magnified and multiplied even more. Now, Paul has clearly said elsewhere in Scripture, so then let's just sin more. He says, no, God forbid. But we need to understand the law makes sin expand in our hearts and this compels us to run in total despair simply to the grace of God driven to Him by faith in Jesus Christ. The law makes me aware that I have a sin problem and therefore I need help. And by the way, this is why it's important that we call sin Sin in our culture today. We need to stand up for what clearly sin is in our culture today. We don't need to appease our culture. We need to remember it was for those sins that Christ died. To appease it is to attack that sacrifice. Society wants to redefine sin as a disease or an excuse or a choice. People want to blame the environment. They want to blame the government. They want to blame a tragedy that happened in their life. But if people don't see themselves as sinners, they will never understand their need of a Savior. Look at verse 22 through 25. But the fruit of the Spirit is, excuse me, oh, it's wrong chapter. But before faith came, we were kept under their guard by the law, kept for faith, which would afterward be revealed. Therefore, the law was our tutor to bring us to Christ that we might be justified by what? By faith. It's been said that you cannot come to Christ to be justified until you have first come through Moses to be condemned. And once you've gone to Moses and acknowledge your sin, guilt and condemnation, you must stay there until you are led to Christ through the Spirit of God. This is why the law was temporary in the first place. The law was never meant to be a permanent solution to our sin. The law of Moses does not hinder or nullify the promise of God that is only available by faith to those who believe. The law cannot change the promise. The law is not greater than the promise. The law is not contrary to the promise. See, the law and the promise work together to bring sinners to faith in Jesus Christ. Which is why Christ said, I did not come to destroy the law, but to fulfill it. The law of Moses with all the ceremonies, all the rituals, all the priesthood, all the sacrifices were never intended to be permanent. They were simply a shadow pointing to the thing of substance, which we talked about in Sunday school this morning. And that substance is Jesus Christ. Faith is important because only faith brings you to joy and vitality and life and peace and rest. If you need rest, 
Stop trying to gain peace and rest by your works. Simply turn to the promise, which is Jesus Christ. Let's pray. Father, thank you so much for the permanence of our faith found in Christ and Christ alone. My faith cannot be taken away because it was finished on the cross of Calvary once I put my faith in Jesus Christ and His work. Father, strengthen us in our view of grace. I pray that we would live in the peace and the rest that it offers. And Lord, that we would allow the law to reveal in us the need for grace. Lord, if there's anyone here this morning who's not put their faith in you and Christ, I pray that today they would acknowledge their need of Jesus Christ and his righteousness. I pray that today they would, as we have often said, confess with their mouth and believe in their heart that Jesus Christ has been raised from the dead so that they can have salvation. Here this morning, you say, Pastor, I've never truly received Christ. I've been depending upon my own work. Been trying to achieve my own righteousness. And all it's done is revealed that I need the grace of Jesus Christ. And you say, Pastor, I just want you to pray for me. I need to know Christ and his grace. Can I see your hand? Anyone in the room this morning? Pastor, pray for me. I need to receive the grace of Jesus Christ. But not only do you need to receive the grace in Jesus Christ, but others need to see of the grace of Christ in you. Just as you cannot be saved by your works, we need to realize that others are to see your good work and glorify your Father in heaven. See, the same grace that saves you can sustain you for daily walk with Christ. Say, Pastor, I need to be sustained. I need encouragement through grace. I'm struggling. Would you pray for me? Can I just see your hand? I see those hands all over the room. Amen. Father, strengthen your church. Allow us to be the light, the city on the hill that you've called us to be. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand together as we sing Away in a Manger. Now, this is going to be the same tune that you've always known. There's going to be some different words, okay? So pay attention to the words. opportunity to express back to you our gratitude and our responsibility in supporting the work of the ministry, realizing that uh, there's nothing that we could give that would go towards our salvation. You took care of that. But this is for us to be obedient in following that which you desire from us. And I want to thank you, Lord, that 
if there's somebody here today who doesn't know you, that this might be the day they would find Christ as their Savior. Amen. There would not be another Christmas without Christ. Mm. And we'll just thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. Appreciate you worshiping with us today. Let's stand as we sing our final song together. We'll be dismissed following the song. Remind you, there's no evening worship tonight. Enjoy your family. Joyful, joyful.